Good morning, church. Good morning. Today we come to the last part of our series, the Nullifier series. And just for those of you who happen to join us this week, all right, in this series, we are basically talking about the things in our life, the attitudes in our life, the things that is hidden in our lives that basically nullifies the work of God in our lives. And so although day in, day out, year in, year out, we do all the things that we ought to do, we do all the right things in God, we come and pray, we come and worship, we come and read the Bible, we do our devotions, we do all the right things but yet our lives never draw closer to God because there are things in our lives, our attitudes that nullifies the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so today we come to the last and probably the most important of this series. So take out your sermon notes and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God, Lord we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord this morning we ask for your Spirit to come and speak to us again Lord. Lord we open our hearts to hear from you. Lord would you show us the condition of our hearts, so that we can draw closer to you, so that we can be the people that you want us to be. Lord, just commit the rest of our time unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, like I say, this final part is going gonna, is gonna to be the most important because this is perhaps the one most crucial thing that determines what you do whether it nullifies or it doesn't nullify anything in your life. Or it's the one thing that will help us to counter all the nullifiers in our lives. And that is basically the question of why you do the things you do. Why do you do what you do? What is your motivation? Why, why do you come to church? Why do you worship God? Why do you pray? Why do you, what is the reason for you to be here to do what you do? You know, we can do all the right things, but the question is, why are we doing what we do? You know, and as, 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 as I grow in God, and the more I spend in God, and the more I come to know God, I begin to realize more and more that God is not the God of the external. That our God is a God of the internal. That He's always looking at what's inside and never at what's outside. That's why Paul says in Romans 2, he says this, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from God, from, but from men. Uh, not, but not from men, but from God. You see, friends, you know, what matters for God, most for God is not so much the things we do, but the motive behind why we do what we do. Why we come and pray. Why we come to church on Sunday. Why do we worship? Why do we sing songs before Him? Why do, we, why do we call ourselves a Christian? Why we do what we do. And that's why 1 Samuel 16, God says, For the Lord sees, does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, the outward actions, the things we do, the prayers we say, the, the worship we do, the hands that we lift up. God does not look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And you know, there are many cases in the Bible of people doing the right things but having the wrong, out, the opposite outcome from God because they did not do it with the, the, the right heart or with the right spirit. You know, a story, an example is Ananias and Sapphira. Those of you who know in the, in the, in the book, book of Acts, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, they did the right thing. You know, they sold a piece of land and they gave the, 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 the proceeds to the church. They gave it. Okay, they didn't give all of it. They gave maybe about half of it. But, you know, they did something right. I mean, how many of you here would sell a piece of land, sell a house and give half of it to the church? Most of you don't do that, right? Anybody here wants to do that? You guys don't do that. And Ananias and Sapphira was doing the right thing. They sold something and they gave it to the church. But they did it with the wrong motive. Not because they wanted to give and bless the church, but because they wanted the recognition from the church. They wanted people to see, wow, you are so good, you are so great, you, have, you, you, know, you are so uh, generous. And because of that, the Lord struck them dead. Another example in the book of Acts is the seven sons of Sceva. Those of you who know the story in Acts chapter 19, you know, this, they, they were doing the right thing. They were going around and they were casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They were helping people who were afflicted. They were delivering people from demons. But something was, because they did not do it with the right heart, with the right spirit, 
The Bible tells us that rather than, than, being, than, than being able to cast out the demons, the demons overpowered them because their heart was not right. Another example is Simon. Not Simon Peter, the disciple, but another Simon, a, a magician in the book of Acts chapter 8. This, this Simon, you know, he did the right thing. He saw Peter laying hands on people and receiving the Holy Spirit. And he came to be saying, I also want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want, I mean, it's the right thing. It's the right, right things to say that, Lord, I want to receive more of you. I want your anointing. I want your blessing. I want your experience. He did right. But the Bible tells us his motive was not right. He wanted it because of his own glory. He wanted it for his own magic show to increase his own power. His spirit was not right. And because of that, he too was struck. You should write the first point of your notes is this. Wrong motives doesn't make right actions right. Wrong motives does not make right actions right. Many times we think that as long as I do the right things, it is enough. But you know, friends, it is not the things that we do that matter so much, but the source of which it comes from. Because the source of it will determine everything that is downstream. What comes from the source will determine what happens. No matter how good or how right the actions are, the source is what determines it, the quality of it. I mean, let me give you an example. You know, you know those of you who are living in Selangor site, even getting KL also affected, right? You know, many times we keep hearing water treatment plant shut down, water treatment plant shut down because of somebody upstream go and pour diesel in the water. Somebody upstream got some chemical spill. Something upstream happened. You see, friends, the problem is this, the water treatment plants were working perfectly. There was nothing wrong with the water treatment plants. They were functioning at 100% efficiency. They are working perfectly. They are doing all the right things. But because the source of it, the source of the water was contaminated. The source was not right. And because the source is not right, it doesn't matter how efficient or how good your water treatment plant is because the source was not right. Likewise in our hearts. It doesn't matter what we are doing that is right, but the source of which it is coming. And that's why I'm convinced, you know, the Bible tells us the story of, in Genesis, in, Cain, in the story of Cain and Abel. One came and offered to God. The other brother came and offered to God. God accepted one and God rejected the other one. So, you know, scholars have been debating it for years about why this is that. And they say, oh, because of this food, lah, because of that, lah, because of whatever reason. But I'm convinced in my heart. That as I look at the scriptures and I look at the, the heart of God, I believe it was not the offering that God rejected, but the heart behind that offering. The heart, the source of which that offering came from. And that's why Matthew 12, 34 says this, when Jesus called it, the, the, the Pharisees, said, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because it's not just the, the, the words that God sees, it's the abundance of the heart. What comes out from the heart? So friends, this morning, why do you come to church? Why do you worship God? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you call yourself a Christian? Why do you do the things you do? Well, very quickly, first thing, there's, most people, there are three ways Three things that motivates us. Number one, which you write in your notes, number one, most of many of us, we are motivated by fear. We are motivated by fear. You know, and we are fear of punishment or fear of judgment. And say, I, uh, if I don't follow God, uh, if I don't follow Jesus, uh, I, uh, after I go to hell. Uh. Okay, then I don't go to hell. Uh. Maybe, you know, if I don't come to church on Sunday uh, later, after if I go, I go jalan jalan, instead I do something else, I get accident, instead, okay, better, uh, I come and worship God first. So I get my protection. So that, I, you know, so that I, I scared that something happened to me. I scared something bad happened to me. And you know, sometimes churches in the past, you know, we have churches that do that. We have pastors that will come out to church and say, you know, you better watch yourself. You better believe in Christ or you will go to hell. And if you don't behave yourself, you know, if you don't say the right things, you don't do the right things, you will go to hell. You know, and, and, when, and, when, and when you are sitting at home and in that moment when you're doing something that you know you should not be doing and Jesus come back at that moment, you are going to hell. And what we do? We instill fear into the hearts of people. They're telling you you're going to go to hell. You don't have punishment. God is going to judge you. You know, and I have a problem, you know. I don't, let, me, let me tell you honestly. I believe in tithing. 
I believe with all my hearts in tithing, 10% tithing, I believe with that. But I have a problem when people come up and give testimony and say, you know, you know, I had to give tight 10% and, that, and one day, I, one month, I didn't give tight 10%, God gave me a car accident which cost me 10% of my salary. And because of that, I, from then onwards, I give 10%. Friends, that doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. You know, and many of us, Lord, we, we, many times, we are motivated by fear or by consequences. That if I don't worship God, there will be a consequence. If I don't come to church, there will be a consequence. If I don't serve God, there will be a consequence. You know, the story is told of these two brothers. You know, they were very, very naughty brothers, very young kids, and they were very naughty, and they always like to steal things, hide things, and do a lot of naughty things, and they drive their parents crazy. And so one day the parents came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I don't know what to do with my children. Now, these two boys, they are just so terrible. Can you counsel them? The pastor said, no problem, no problem. But I, I, I want to talk to them one at a time. I don't want to talk to them together. They said, okay, fine. So the parents sent the eldest boy to the pastor first. And so the pastor sit down with the eldest boy and he looked at the boy, the young boy, he looked at him nicely and said, Son, where is God? The boy looked at him and just completely silent. Son, where is God? The boy got even more worried. And the pastor seeing the boy just don't want to answer him. The pastor raised his voice, Son, where is God? Immediately the boy ran out of the, the church, ran all the way back to the house, ran up to the brother's room, look at the brother and say, Brother, we're in big trouble. They lost God and they think we had something to do with it. <laughs> That's what happens when you're motivated by fear. When fear drives you when fear pushes you, when the reason you do what you do is because of fear. You see, friends, the tendency of this is, the danger of it is this, that when we are motivated by fear, then what will happen is that you will always do the bare minimum. Because that's all I'm motivated by. Like because, of, because of consequences, let me just, I'll just do the bare minimum that will allow me to avoid the consequence. That's all I want. Because that's all that I'm motivated for is the bare minimum. And so some of us, what is the bare minimum? Come to church? Okay, bare minimum. Read the Bible? Okay, bare minimum. What is the bare minimum that I need to do? And that is what I will do because the bare minimum is because I, because I do not want the consequences. I just will do the bare minimum. You know, it's like us, you know, when we drive on the plus highway. You know, most of us, uh, we drive, you all drive, you all will drive at 100 and the speed limit is 110, right? And so some of you, you'll drive at 130, 100 and, you know, but if, you, if you, you're fearful of getting summon, you'll drive at 110. But never mind lah, because we know whatever police camera got error, got margin of error, 10% one, right? So we drive at 120, that's our bare minimum. Because we don't want to get summon, we are scared of summon. So 120, bare minimum. But then during festive season, better still, those of us who got inside information, we get a list of all the camera hotspots where the police will set up camera road traps. And then we know where all those places are, so we will drive 130, 140, and the moment we come to those areas, we'll come to the bare minimum, 190, 109, so that we don't hit the camera. Because we'll just do the bare minimum. And that's what happens when we are motivated by fear. You see, friends, because, because you know why? Because fear changes your immediate actions, but not your heart. It changes your immediate actions, but you will never change your heart. You know, when I was young, when I was in, maybe in primary school or kindergarten or primary school, uh, when I was very young, one thing I hated to do was brushing my teeth. I do not know why, I just hated doing it. And I, I had a very good reason for not brushing my teeth. Because when you have milk teeth, it's going to fall off anyway, Right? It's going to, you're going to drop it, it's going to fall off, it's not the, it's not the adult teeth. And so why do you need to take care of it? It's going to, you're going to lose it anyway. But you know, mothers being mothers, they don't understand logic. So my mother would always insist, no, nope, you must brush your teeth, go and brush your teeth. And, but I don't want to brush my teeth. I hate brushing my teeth. And so you know what I do? Every morning I will go to the night or what, I'll go to the toilet, I will lock the door, and I'll spend maybe 10 minutes in the toilet doing whatever I want to do. I will take the toothbrush, I will wet it. I will rub the toothbrush on my hand to show that it was being used. I would splash, splash water everywhere on the sink. I would uh, gargle my mouth so that it's wet. I will give all the appearance that I have brushed my teeth. But I did not brush my teeth. Because, my, because I fear my mother scolding me, I did all the appearance of brushing my teeth, but I still hated brushing my teeth. Don't worry, today I brush my teeth. But that's what happened. 
Fear will change your outward actions, but it will never change your heart. So sometimes most of us are motivated by fear. The second thing is that many of us, we are motivated by rewards. We are motivated by rewards. You know, society today is a, what can I get out of it society? You know, that's the society we live in today. What can I get out of it? Okay, God, you want me to worship you? What can I get out of it? What can I get out of following Jesus? What can I get out of becoming a Christian? What can I get out of it? What is it for me? What is it in it for me? What do I gain from it? And it's a society we live in today. I mean, even parents, we teach our children that consciously or subconsciously, that's how we teach them. You know, when, when my daughter was young, you know, when she was, she was our first child, before the boy was born, she, when she was young, I think when we was, she was maybe three years old, four years old, you know, kindergarten, uh, she doesn't like to eat. And so we are trying to get her to eat more. And then one day I realized she actually loves McDonald's fried chicken. She likes the chicken. I mean, no, sorry, not the chicken. She likes the french fries more than the chicken. And she likes the chicken, but she likes the chicken skin more than the chicken. And she doesn't want to eat the chicken. And so I have to sit down there and say, okay, fine, I will peel for you the small pieces, five pieces of chicken. You finish that five pieces of chicken, you get this one piece of fries. You finish another five pieces of chicken, you get this one piece of skin. And the, the, the older she gets, the smarter she becomes. Then it becomes now, you, then you have, to, you have, to, have to give her 10 pieces, I mean, 5 pieces of chicken, you get 2 fries. And the older she gets, 5 pieces of chicken, you get 3 fries in order to get her to eat the chicken. You know, but that's, that's the kind of society we are living in. You know, where it is, what can I get out of it? If you, I don't see a reward, I don't see something out of it, I ain't going to do it. And many times for us, we come to God the same. Even though this is something that is good for us, but we come to God and say, Lord, what can I get out of it? What can I get out of it? And the danger is this, that when we come to God motivated by rewards, the danger is many of times when we don't get what we want. When what we desire doesn't come to pass. Yeah, we still follow God. We still come to church. You ask me to do this, okay, I'll still do this, I'll still do that. But that passion dies off. That excitement is no more there. That conviction on what you're doing is dissipated. And you still do what you do, but you're no longer motivated to do it. You're no longer doing it with excitement, with joy. Yeah, okay lah, because I'm already in it already. Ah, yeah, I might as well do it lah, who knows. By the way, maybe God will bless me at the end of the day. Because when I first came in, when I first became a Christian, I was so on fire for God because I knew that God would bless my marriage. I knew that God would make my life better in my marriage. And so I come to God, I serve God. But after one, two years, I see my wife getting from worse to worse. Nag me even more, scold me even more. Ayola. Then I come to church, I say, Ay, God, I'm tired. I don't get from you what I expect from you. My life is still the same. My children are still the same. My job is still the same. My career is still the same. And we still come. We still worship. But we've lost all that conviction. We've lost all that passion. I want always ask, ask this question. If there is no reward of heaven and no penalty of hell, will you still follow Jesus? Let me say this again clearly. If there is no reward of heaven and there is no penalty of hell, will you still follow Jesus? Will you still worship Jesus? Would you still call yourself a disciple of Jesus? If there's no reward of heaven and there's no penalty of hell, will you still follow Jesus? Well, if you're motivated by fear or you're motivated by rewards, the answer will be no. But if you're motivated by the third one, and that is to be motivated by love. Motivated by love. And friends, this is the highest motivation. This is the highest motivation. But what is love? I mean, honestly, what is love today? I mean, sometimes my wife will look at me and say, I love you, honey, and the next day you say, I love chocolates. What's the difference? Is her love for me just on par with her love for chocolates? Or is her love for chocolate as great as her love for me? I don't know what it means. But you know, but, but sometimes we, we don't really know what love is. 
Let me just give you a, a definition of love by children today. This, a a six-year-old said this, Love is when you go out to eat and, some, and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. A seven-year-old boy says this, Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still say he is handsomer than Robert Redford. A age four girl, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> a six-year-old boy, love is when mommy sees daddy on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. What is love? You know, something about love is this. Love has many qualities, many standards of love. And that's why Philippians 1, 9, Paul says this, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge, that your love may abound more and more, that your love may increase in its abundance, increase in its standard, increase in its quality. You know, everything in life has a quality. Every product in life has a quality. You know, you know back, 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 back what, when we were in Malacca, in my first year in Malacca, you know, what a member of the church blessed my family with an iPad, a small little mini iPad, real Apple iPad, not a fake iPad, the Apple iPad. And so when we were starting to just play around with it, and my children were like playing, oh, I got games one. Ah. By the time my boy was something like three years old or four years old, and you know, being a little boy and he's seeing all the things that you're supposed to hit and press, the way he hits it's like, bah, bah, I got like, ayo, new iPad, don't I'll give a three-year-old boy and smash it up to pieces afterward. So what I did was I went to one of those uh, shopping malls, those cheap digital malls, and I bought him a 100 ringgit iPad or 80 ringgit iPad or something like that, a fake, those type of cheap, cheap imitation iPad. And I, I, it, worked. It's, it, works, it works as well. He can play all the games that he can play. So I brought it home, let him play. But after one month of bam, 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 this doesn't work. That doesn't work. It starts going haywire. Everything goes create chaos. Why? The difference is the quality of product. The quality is still the same product. It still does the same thing. But the difference is the quality of that product. Same thing with our love. There's a different quality of love. You can have a high quality love or you can just be a cheap imitation love. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, though all I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. In other words, Paul is saying, even if I do all the right things for God, but if I don't have love, it's nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And that's how important it is to be motivated, not just by love, but by a high quality of love. You know why? Because a high quality love, would you write the next part of those notes is this, a high quality love transforms fear to reverence. It transforms fear to reverence. First, Corinthians, First John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And, but, but Proverbs 9, 10 says, fear the Lord. So what is this here? Does it doesn't mean that I love the Lord, there is no fear, but the other verse says, fear the Lord. So what is it? Do I fear God or do I not fear God? Very simple. It's because quality, high quality love transforms fear to reverence. A low quality fear would keep fear in an unhealthy way. You know, there's a healthy fear and there's an unhealthy fear. And a low-quality love will cause us to have an unhealthy fear. An unhealthy fear is one that shies away, that runs away, that stays away from something because you fear that thing. I mean, it's like phobias. Lah. You don't know about phobias, right? It's like, it's like, let me give you the top, uh, some of the worst, world's most unusual phobias or weirdest phobias. First is what they call hepaphobia, fear of being touched. Ergophobia, fear of work. Hypnophobia, fear of sleep. Xenophobia, fear of Chinese people. <laughs> you want to know what's fear of Indians? Mikati koni indaka phobia. <laughs> Kakorafiophobia, fear of failures. 
But this is the best one of all. It is called phobophobia. You know what is that? Fear of phobias. You know, that's a, that is an example of an unhealthy fear. A fear that drives you away. A fear that, 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 that pushes you away from something. But the, old, but the Bible always tells us to fear the Lord. But that kind of fear is a fear that draws you close. A fear that comes with respect, with reverence. You know, it's, like, it's, like, it's like electricity, you know. You know, as a, you know electricity is something, I'm talking about high-power electricity, it comes in thousands of wattage. You know, and that kind of electricity, you just touch it only, uh, you will die. You come close to the wires, to the tower, it will strike you dead. But that same power, that same wattage, when given the right respect and the right uh, use, it can light up cities. It can power cities and power buildings and make, and make life so different. But it all depends on how you treat it. If you treat it with a lexical attitude, it will strike you dead. It will zap you, you get electrocuted. But when you treat it with reverence and the respect that it needs, you harness its power. Same thing. When you come to God, and when you have reverence, when, when you have a high quality love for God, you will not fear Him, but you will not have an unhealthy fear. But you will come with Him, your fear will be reverence. There will be a deep reverence for God. And when you come to God, you know, it won't be a fear that drives you, but you will have a high reverence, a high respect, a righteous fear for God. Secondly, a high quality love, which you write in the notes, a high quality love does not seek reward, but is always grateful. It does not seek rewards, but is always grateful. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love does not seek its own. It does not seek its own. It does not seek its own welfare. It does not seek its own benefit. It does not seek what is great for what is what is in for him. It doesn't seek anything for its own. A high quality love does not seek its own. But it's always grateful. It's always grateful. You know? It's like, it's like how we approach the love of God in our lives. How many of you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Raise your hand. How many believe? How many of you believe that Jesus died for all your past sins, all the sins that you committed in the past? Raise your hands. Praise the Lord. How many of you believe that Jesus also died for all the sins that you will commit in the future? Raise your hands. Uh, slightly lesser people. But it's what God did, you know. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all the sins of the world. Past, present, future, the sins that you can commit, Jesus died for all of it. And when we, when, we, when we understand that, wow, you mean God, you've died for all my past sins? And you have died for all my future sins? Yay, I can do anything I want now, right? Well, it depends on the quality of love in your heart. Whether you, you know, and it depends on your response. Sometimes you look at God and say, oh God, you mean you've done all this for me? You died for all my past sins? You died for any sin that I can commit? You've already died for me? Yay, I can do whatever I want now. Or, we can look at it and, Lord, you mean you died for all my past? And you mean you also died for all my future sins? Anything that I haven't done yet, you've already died for that? Wow. How can I ever betray you? How can I ever take it lightly? How can I ever take it for granted? Wow. What's the difference? That quality of love in your heart. If, that, if, if you're sitting here right now, and in your heart, it is like, yes, I'm free, I'm in Christ, I can do whatever I want, yeah. You have a very low quality love. But a high quality love will always look at what Jesus does in our life. To look at everything that God has done in our life and say like, wow, God, I'm just so undeserving. You're just so great. But finally, friends, a, the last point on your notes, a high quality love makes pleasing Jesus your highest priority. It makes pleasing Jesus your highest priority. That's what love is all about. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He who does not love me does not keep my word. You see, friends, true love, a high quality love basically means this, that I will do whatever that person asks or that person wants 
for no other reason than it pleases that person. That's all. And that's what a high-quality love is. And so when we talk about Christian love, we talk about an agape love, a sacrificial love, a love that doesn't look at me and what is in for me, but a love that asks what pleases Jesus. That I just want to do whatever I need to do just because for no other reason but to please Jesus. And that's all I want. I just want to please Him. And that becomes my highest priority. Not to please my family, not to please my children, not to please my parents, not to please anybody, but to please Jesus. That's why Luke 14 reminds us, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. A high quality love makes pleasing Jesus our only purpose. You know, sometimes when I, I didn't realize this, you know, until one day when I was just looking at, you know, the way my wife and me. And one day I was just doing things to please my wife. I mean, as a good husband, we, we, we want to please our wives, right, husbands? You know, that's our, our, our life purpose, we want to please our wives. But one day it just struck me that as I was doing something just to please my wife, I began to wonder suddenly, am I doing this because it bring, it's, that my motive is to please my wife? Or because I'm doing this so that I can please her so that she doesn't make life miserable for me. <laughs> Ever heard the saying, happy wife, happy life? So am I pleasing my wife so that my life is better? So that I'm okay? So that she doesn't treat me bad and she doesn't give, make, 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 get angry at me and I'm pleasing her because of that? And when I realized that, I began to wonder in my life with God, is it the same? Am I doing things for God because I just don't want to get consequences? Because I'm hoping to gain something out of it? Or is, am I just doing what I need to do for God because I just want to please Him? And that becomes my highest motivation. Nothing else but to please God. Why? Because He's worthy and He deserves it. And that's all I want to do. And friends, when we begin to have this motivation, when we begin to be motivated by love, not a low quality love, but a high quality love, what happens is, friends, it nullifies all the nullifiers. Everything that we're talking about in this series, all that we talk about, all the attitudes that we have that is not right, friends, but when we start work, doing the right things for God, we start coming to God with all the right things that we do, but we are doing it out of love for no other reason but to please God. It nullifies it nullifies all the things that nullifies the work of God. It nullifies it all. Because that is our highest motivation. So how do we start loving God? How do we do that? How do we start increasing the quality of love? Simple. Start by loving those around you. Start by loving those around you. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. He who does not love does not know God. If, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother who has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment I have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. You want to increase your quality of love for God? Very simple. Start loving the people. Start increasing your quality of love for the people around you. You see, it's a paradox, you know. When you start increasing your love for the people around you, your quality of love for God increases. And as, you inc and as, as your quality of love for God increases, your love for people increases. And as your love for people increases, the quality of your love for God increases. It's a paradox, but that's how it works. And it starts by loving people. It starts by loving the people around you. It starts by loving the people that God has placed in your life. And so, friends, if you want to have a high-quality love, you need to start loving people around you. Only then, only then will you have a high-quality love. And only then can your love, your motivation for doing the things you do, nullify the nullifiers in your life. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the honour. And Lord, this morning, I just want to commit all of us here into your hands this morning. Friends, you know we have been singing this closing song for this whole series. 
I just want to, before we, be, before we go into the song, I want to take a moment this morning and let the Lord search your heart this morning. And ask yourself this question that I asked just now. If there was no reward of heaven and there is no penalty of hell, will you still follow Jesus? Ask yourself this morning, friends. Let the Holy Spirit search your heart. Are you motivated by fear of consequences? Or is your motivation the things that you can get out? What is it in it for me? Or is there a high quality love in your hearts? I pray this morning that there will be our prayer that we will have a high quality love. Let us stand to our feet. And as we sing this song for this final time for this series, let's make this our prayer. That Lord, it doesn't matter if I used to follow you because of fear. It doesn't matter if I used to follow you because of rewards. This morning, Lord, I want to increase my love for you. I want to make love. I want to make pleasing you my highest motivation and none other. I don't want to be the same, Lord. I don't want to leave this hall the same I was as I came in. I don't want to leave this hall with the same fear, with the same desire for rewards. I want to leave this hall with a desire for a high-quality love for you.